Please won't you pray with me? May the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts together find their way into the heart of God this morning. Amen. You have to know your body as a home for God. So the structure of the tabernacle, if we're thinking of our bodies as tabernacles, the structure of the tabernacle and temple was threefold. It had an outward wall or fence, and inside that fence was called the outer court. The outer court protected the inner court, which consisted of the holy place and the holy of holies. If you were an Israelite during the 40 years in the wilderness who wanted to go to the tabernacle to access the Spirit of God, the physical structure of the outer court was the first thing you would notice. Um, down on our floor, we have rugs that symbolize the outer court. A wall of fine white linen surrounding the tabernacle, this outer court separated the tabernacle from the rest of the world while representing its contents. We are the dwelling place for God. We have the outer person who physically interacts with the world every day, but inside our bodies there is an inner person. This inner person is composed of two sections, our spirit and our soul. Our body, our words, and our actions are the doorway through which one has to pass in order to access the light of God in us. And how we access the light of God in each other, sort of like in yoga class when we say namaste, the light in me recognizes the light in you, yes? Much of the time we have walled ourselves off to protect our precious inner sanctum. We think our soul will be safer if we keep it on lockdown, closed off. And we have guards. We have guards at the outer court whose only aim is to protect the most sacred and vulnerable parts of us. The guards protect us from shame by numbing us, by freezing us or helping us to fight or flee. And while we should get to know them and love them, and thank our guards for their service, the guards often make our divine selves harder to access. Do you know what I mean? No, you don't, Toby. <laughs> we have protectors uh, around the gates of our heart that we wall off so that we can't get hurt. Does that make sense? Yes. Last week I was uh, driving home from Chalks at Middle School. I had picked up my daughter, Eloisa, from her play practice, and my son Isaac was in the back seat. And when I turned onto Route 12, the truck behind me sped up to tailgate me very quickly. He was clearly very angry at the speed I had chosen to maintain on Route 12. And I am not someone who is prone to road rage, actually, but this man was scaring me people who have particularly large vehicles that they use to intimidate people with smaller vehicles, like this man, coupled with some obvious anger, make me scared. Especially when I am driving in my neighborhood, in my sweet town, with my most precious cargo on board. When I'm scared, I do not have access to my best self. The guards go up. I'm a pastor, but I'm not Jesus. So, <laughs> you can imagine <laughs> the words that started coming out of my mouth. They are not fit for this pulpit, much less for my children's ears. And I could see in my rearview mirror that he was raging and sputtering and taking a picture of the car I was driving, which also worried me. Was he gonna like post this on the internet? Was I gonna be on the Sterling Mass community page? <laughs> <laughs> Did anybody see me on the Sterling Mass community page? Yeah, okay. I try not to check that thing. In response to my tirade, one of my kids thought it would be funny to hold up a certain finger I know. They did not learn this from me. 
<laughs> Doesn't matter who it was, Eloisa. I said one of my kids, I have several kids, so you can just imagine. I spent the rest of the car ride lecturing them on how wrong it is to use obscene gestures at other humans, never mind how dangerous it is to provoke angry people driving large vehicles in a country in which rage is the new religion, amen? And it gave me pause to reflect, and it's certainly not the first time in my parenting career. <laughs> Careful the things you say, Stephen Sondheim says, children will listen. Careful the things you do, children will see and learn. I did not send the message that the aggressive, angry truck driver was a child of the same God as I was um, exclaiming my feelings about him in front of my babies. I called him names that dehumanized him and my kids heard, and no wonder their bodies responded in kind, yes? And I wanna teach them something different. You have to know your body as a home for God. In our scripture today, Jesus wants the disciples to understand that it is not purity rituals like washing your hands that matter. It's not what you wear so you don't have to, you know, I, I don't know, button up so that your body looks more like a temple. This is not the message that I am sending this morning. It is not what you eat or drink that defiles your body. Jesus says, listen and understand. It is not what goes into the mouth that defiles a person. And then he talks about the sewer, so then we have to imagine, you know. It is what comes out of the mouth, what comes out of the mouth that defiles the person. Jesus says that evil comes from within the human heart and then desecrates the person on the outside. There is nothing going in that can defile, but only what is going out can defile, he says. For it is from within, from the human heart, that evil intentions come. The words themselves matter because the outer court reflects the contents inside, yes? Now, you and I are not Jesus. <laughs> if I'm not, I'm sure you're not either. We are only human doing the best that we can. With God's help, we have the power to change what comes out of our mouth by healing what is in our hearts and minds. This is the good news. Second Corinthians says that, for which cause we faint not, but through our outward man perish, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. So to degenderize that language, our inward humanity is renewed day by day. Yay, right? We don't have to keep flipping off the people in the car behind us. We can actually change our hearts, soften them. God is in the business of renewing, of, of uh, ripping our hearts of stone out of our chest and replacing them with hearts of flesh. Our scriptures say that every day. So years ago, I think it was 2017, I read this story about this man named Christian Picciolini. Um, and his story begins as a, a young child growing up in Chicago with Italian immigrants for parents. He, he came from a good family, but as recent immigrants to America, his parents had to work all the time, so he was always alone. They had two jobs each. And so he was feeling emotionally neglected, and as a young middle schooler, he was small and he was bullied often, and he didn't fit in at school and generally didn't have a place to belong, and so he was angry. His guards at the gate were out. At age 14, he found in one of the most notorious and deadly white supremacist groups in the nation an identity, a purpose, a place to channel his rage the new religion, and a place to belong. He rose up as one of the biggest leaders in the movement quickly, starting a white power punk rock band and touring the world and recruiting young vulnerable white boys into the community. As a teenager, Christian was expelled from his high school six times, three of those for beating up the same black classmate. 
He was finally kicked out of his high school for good after calling the African-American principal horrific racial slurs, threatening the lynching of all the black people in Chicago, and trying to start a fight with the African-American head of security at the school. He was restrained by that same man and later arrested. A high school dropout and skinhead, Christian got married young at 19 and soon after had two young boys. And so at 21, his hard shell was cracked open a little bit and a tiny ray of light shone in his darkness. That's what happens sometimes when you have a baby. Christian started to ask himself what he was made for, white supremacy or being a husband and father. He started to have a new sense of allegiance, belonging and identity to the, um, to the young family he had given life to. He left the streets in those years to protect his family, but he still didn't leave the movement. Instead, Christian opened a record store to sell his white power music, the only true business he knew. People would come from all over the country to buy it. He knew, though, that if he only sold white supremacist music, the community would see him as a threat and shut down his business. So he also sold some hip hop, punk, and other genres. And as a result of the diverse array of music his store sold, Christian began to meet and form relationships with people in the communities that he had long purported to hate. One day, a black man about his age came into the store and he was noticeably shaken and tearful. And Christian decided to ask him what was wrong and he found out that the man's mother had breast cancer. And Christian felt compassion and kinship for this man because Christian's mother was recently diagnosed with breast cancer. Another week, a gay couple came in and Christian watched them tenderly care for their little boy. He had a sudden realization that this couple loved their little boy just as much as he loved his children and he related to them instantly. Another week, he met and talked with recent immigrants. Their story reminded him of his own parents' immigration story and how hard they had to work just to survive and take care of him. Suddenly, instead of hating immigrants for taking jobs, he remembered that he too was the son of hardworking immigrants. Christian slowly began to see more in common with the people he once hated than the hate group he was associated with. God is in the business of taking out our hearts of stone and replacing them with hearts of beating flesh. And he began to be embarrassed about the primary source of his income now that he had made these new connections. So he closed the store. And as a result, he lost everything that he had worked for. However, he didn't denounce the white power movement entirely, so his family left him soon after. He was depressed and lost. And eventually, a friend got him a new job installing computers. One day, Christian had to go to his old high school to install a computer. Terrified to confront his past, Christian saw the African-American head of security that he fought with years before, who still worked there. Christian followed the man to the parking lot and tapped him on the shoulder. The man stepped back in fear, recognizing him, and Christian couldn't think of what to say. Finally, he stammered, I'm sorry. And the man moved forward to embrace him. I forgive you the man said, but I ask that you do one thing, go out and tell your story to everyone who will listen. That day changed Christian's life forever. He says, I received compassion from the people I deserved it least from when I least deserved it, and that changed me. He has now counseled over 100 people out of the white supremacy movement through his organization, Life After Hate, and I'm sure that that has gone way up in the last eight years. He speaks in prisons and in schools. He wrote a book about his journey, two books now, and teaches about the spread and psychology of hate groups. He shines the light of God from within the recesses of his soul every day in the darkness of hate, and he does it with love. When Christian meets young white supremacists, he doesn't try to convince them that they are wrong or bad. He doesn't shame them. He listens with compassion. He listens for potholes in their life and he fills them. He listens for alienation and he finds them community. He listens for anger and loneliness and he offers them hope and connection. 
He helps them get job skills, tattoo removal, counseling, and self-esteem building. And he doesn't stop there. He brings them to meet people that they purport to hate. He says that hate comes from fear of the unknown. It is almost impossible to hate people when you know their story. It is what comes from the human heart out of the human mouth that defiles. And the good news, with God, the human heart can be made new. It's what it was made for. Our inward humanity is renewed day by day, and therefore so is our outward. On our Lenten journey, may we be open to this heart change. May we receive forgiveness when we least deserve it. May we recognize that, and may that grace change us. Let us together rehumanize all that has been dehumanized, let us heal the inside so that what is on the outside brings hope and healing to a raging world. When we create heaven in our hearts, we can create heaven on the earth. It's what we are made for. Amen. <laughs>